welcome to join our seminar today. My name is Alan. I am the host today and also the class coordinator of the reading and writing program from Harmony Plus. So in today's seminar, we're very glad to invite Dr. Glenn to talk about how to improve children's nonfiction reading and writing skills. So before starting today's seminar, let me introduce our company background briefly. Harmony Plus is an official partner of leading universities and institutions in the United States, such as UC Berkeley, Stanford International Research Institute, and San Jose State University. We are committed to providing top-notch programs to outstanding local and international students. At Harmony Plus, we offer a variety of programs. First of all, the academic programs, such as reading and writing, AP chemistry, AP English literature and composition, ACT, ACT prep, college ACT per writing. Then the soft skill enhancement program, for example, the Future Entrepreneur Challenge, public speaking. Also the professor research programs, such as data strategy, strategic marketing, internet of things. We also provide the college counseling services known as future planning. At Harmony Plus, we adopt a hybrid learning platform which combines online with offline, school with students, theory with practice, and education with service. So during our webinar today, if you have any questions, you can leave your comments in the Zoom chat box. At the end of the seminar, we're going to have a Q&A session. So today, we're very glad to invite Dr. Glenn with us. Glenn is a senior coach at Harmony Plus. He got BA from University of Notre Dame, MA from University of Hawaii, PhD major in education at University of Wisconsin. Glenn has over 10 years experience teaching, reading and writing to middle school and high school students. Glenn has also successfully guided nearly 100 high school students through the college application process. Of these applications, many students were admitted to top universities, including Harvard, Columbia, Cornell, Stanford, UPenn, CIT, MIT, etc. So Glenn, can you say hi to our audience today? Hello, hello. Nice to be here with you all. Thank you for you know, taking your time to listen to me and talk at you. Great, so uh, I'd like to remind all our audiences in the Zoom uh, meeting right now, please stay muted while you are in the waiting room, okay? And uh, today we're going to talk about first, the importance of writing for students, ways to develop children's capability in reading and writing, the introduction to some writing competitions, the benefits of the nonfiction reading and writing to students. And also we are going to have a 10 minutes Q&A session at the end of the seminar. So first of all, Dr. Glenn, uh, in your opinion, why is important, the writing is so important for our students? Sure. So, I mean, most importantly, regardless of whether or not it should be, Writing is one of the primary ways students are assessed in terms of comprehension. So this means even if you know you understand some concept, and maybe you can even express it verbally, if you can't write your answer in a way that is clearly understandable, you simply won't get the grades. So the key to effective writing is making sure it is clear and understandable. That's what quality writing is all about. This matters for grades because, again, if the teacher doesn't understand what you're trying to get across to them, then you won't be getting the grades that you need to be successful. And often how they assess is writing. But this is also going to matter post-education. Writing is the primary means of communicating in the workplace. It's about how you get your ideas across to other people. And there, again, they always care about clarity. Additionally, there are a lot of connections between writing and reading. If you can't write well, you can't read as purposefully because you don't know what you were looking for in terms of answers. And if you can't read well, then you have no chance of having that correct syntax, that correct grammar. 
a key part of having quality grammar in your writing is just exposure to quality grammar, seeing that syntax over and over again. So really, writing and reading are deeply interconnected. The number one thing that you need to have in terms of writing and writing with clarity is organization. There are a lot of tools out there that'll help you with grammar and spelling, right? Like this is Grammarly. This is that when you were underlined on your Word document, it's got that red. Like you don't need to know how to spell as well right now, but you do need to have the ability to write organized and have clear development of ideas. They just don't have the AI for that yet. So this is where you need to practice. Organization and development of ideas go hand in hand. If you have organized writing that follows a clear structure, that structure can lend yourself to creating that more specific analysis, creating that more enlightened synthesis. These are the 21st century skills that colleges want, that jobs want, and that's important for no matter whatever field you go into. That's right. So as writing is so important for the students, a lot of parents are concerned that how can they help develop children's capabilities in reading and writing? Can you share some of your opinions? Right. I mean, this is a real concern.、Um, I definitely feel for parents growing up、uh, raising kids in today's world because there is this real need to increase our children's capacities because there's this constant competition to maximize our competitive advantage. To get to those elite jobs, to get to those elite schools, to get to those elite colleges, right? Like this system of competition isn't going away, and the race starts really early. Like、uh, if you want to maximize your chances on getting into these schools and getting those elite jobs, it starts with improving their writing and reading in elementary school and middle school. Um, this is especially important if they're all behind, right? If they're coming in with learning English as a second language, you really got to get them on that right track as early and as soon as possible. So it starts in elementary school. It starts with just reading. Kiddos need to be reading things that they love at an early age. They need exposure to that language. And so your goal for elementary students should be to make them to love reading. If they love reading, they'll do a lot of it, and the more that they do, they'll develop that familiarity with the language, with the sentence structure, with the grammar, with the vocabulary. Which, as I said before, like that is key for their writing ability. And as they develop in this reading,、um, you want them to experience this sort of like back and forth, right, with um, writing, um, with writing and reading, where they write about what they read, and they read about what they write. Um, the simplest form is just making responses, keeping a diary or journal. So as they're reading something, they're like actually writing their responses, their thoughts about it. This is that key sort of getting that analysis being, but getting kids to practice writing so that they can apply the skills they are developing in whatever form is is essential. Often, as I said with the journal, this starts with the personal. It's this narrative writing, if you will, because it's the simplest form. It's writing about you. Then you can transition to more difficult types of writing, like informational and persuasive. But it's best to start with just having the kids write about themselves. Informational, I think, is the most important type of writing because it's what they're going to be doing throughout high school and college. There are key organizational structures they need to learn for this. Persuasive is similar to informational, and it can supplement it. But ultimately, informational style of writing is the most important. It requires that they are able to write analytically, and it, thus it requires lots of organization and lots of practice in being able to write these informational types of essays. So, Glenn, you mentioned that there are a lot of、uh, informational and also persuasive writings in college, right? So, can you tell us, like,、uh, how the writing are so important for the college application? Right. I mean, it shows up a lot in college, right? This sort of the informational essays and some persuasive essays. But you got to get into college first, right? And apart from the importance in getting these good grades, which are probably the most important part of getting into、uh, into college, the other major way writing shows up 
in the college application is the personal statement. So this is where the narrative writing comes back into play. It's the reflective piece, looking at the why and the lessons you learned and how you have grown as a person. So this is what we try and focus on with our writing narrative uh, units at Harmony Plus. But as you can see, when we're talking about that reflective piece, there's gonna be a lot of overlap with the informational essays because it's ultimately all about analysis. So let me break that down for you. Um, students for the essay have to be, this is for the personal statement essay, have to be able to like look back at their lives and understand um, how they became who they are, what they want to do next, and ultimately that why. So the why is still the most important word out there. Often this requires understanding both larger ideas in the world, understanding yourself, and then understanding how the two interact. If you can understand how you were socialized, for example, how representation of what it means to be American, Asian, Black, White, influenced your decision to do x y or z in your life that's huge for your personal statement that's a great essay but you have to be able to do like both what paulo freire reads calls reading the world and reading yourself this is why we focus so much on analysis in our classes it's ultimately what writing is all about Right. So when students start writing the personal experience in the narrative writing, they actually can like help their future personal statement writing, right? Yeah, that's that's the goal, right? We start and like to spark that interest, spark that style, because it's too often we don't make our kids write in this reflective style until they get to that personal statement. And then they're like, what do I do? And they end up writing all this like fancy English, but really that's not what the colleges are looking for. So that's why we try and get that ideas before they even get to high school. That's right. Yeah. Thanks so much. And uh, uh, some parents mentioned that, you know, their kids already have a very good uh, reading and writing capability. So for the uh, very excellent students, are there any competitions uh, that they can attend or participate? that can help them future application? Yeah, there's a lot of competitions out there. Um, and part of what we do at Harmony Plus, um, and I think what you should ultimately doing as you are like helping your kids navigate this, is to figure out what application or what sort of um, contest best aligns to their interests, right? Like you're trying to create this narrative with your personal statement that is some sort of like story about who they are. And so there's a lot of contests out there. I'm gonna highlight a few of them so you get that sense, but ultimately you gotta pick the ones that are most oriented towards what your kids are. Like this Journalism Education Association one, JEA one. Like this one is very common. It's, uh, it happens during the school year. It's a 300 word essay that's framed around a prompt. Last year's prompt was, during a presidential election cycle, how can local journalism help foster more civic discussion in communities around politics and democracy? Right. So like if you're applying to that one, that is one where maybe you're interested in journalism. That's a great essay for you. The scholastic art and writing competition. This one is very broad. There's lots of different things in there from environment to more of these personal things. Great thing about that. They have prize awards. Um, the two that I really want to highlight. This first one is the one from the New York Times. The New York Times, um, this is like the gold standard for op-eds. This is where like Barack Obama is gonna write an op-ed and he's gonna submit it here. This is where Michelle Alexander, when she's writing about Palestine, I'm gonna put in the New York Times. So using this as our gold standard, this is actually the sort of rubric and goals that we want them to be, a, our students to be able to publish in our citizen journalism class. We're gonna use the same rubric, use that same sort of goals that they have in this one, because this is an ideal contest for kids to be able to get that stamp of like, you are awesome, you are a great writer. And that stamp is what it's all about. And this is particular in this last one, this John F. Uh, Kennedy Profiles and Courage, which that picture on the right is getting that award she's getting. I think the, the winner is getting the award from Nancy Pelosi. So it's got this prestige, right? And this prestige was really on display this year. Um, there's been a lot of like talk of the profiles and courage in the media, 
because the presidential candidate Pete uh, Buttigieg won it when he was in high school writing about Sanders. And that sort of like really catapulted his career, right? Because he won this very prestigious um, award, this Profiles in Courage, and now he was on people's radars. And this is ultimately what we want your students to be able to do, to get these early stamps of like, this kid is a genius. Because if they get that stamp of like, ooh, you won a New York Times uh, scholarship student editorial contest as a middle schooler, then you have that on your resume. You apply to a prestigious summer program. Oh, you're more likely to get in because you have this earlier stamp. Now you've got another stamp of genius. Now you're applying to colleges and they're like, oh, look at this kid. He already made it through all these prestigious things. They must be a genius. Let's accept them to MIT. Oh, you got into MIT. Let's accept you to Stanford Business School. Oh, look, you're at Stanford Business School. Here's a $300,000 job. Like that's how our world works. It is this track that they talk so much about education. Like you're either on the advanced track or you're on the like lower track. And it, the older you get, it's harder to break these tracks. Is this track fair? Is this track just? No, but that is the way the world works. And as long as that world is the way that it is, we have to help our kids make sure they are on the right track, which is what getting them to do these contests early is all about. So uh, you mentioned that when students are participating in some of the contests, they have to write the op-ads, right? Mm -hmm. So the types of writing op-ads, can you uh, elaborate on it? Yeah, so these op-eds, like opinion editorial, that's just an abbreviation for it. You will see these um, in the Chronicle, you'll see these in any major newspaper, they'll even have them in like school newspapers. They're just a, a style of writing where you're taking some sort of key issue in the world and giving your opinion on it. So, so it's critical for being able to understand the world, being able to be like this fluent citizen of the world. And also it's like how you, it's often how you write in high school. There's often going to be a unit or a topic about persuasive writing. So this is a key life skill, but also a key academic skill. Okay, so as we're talking about the different types of the reading and writing, so uh, a lot of parents uh, mentioned that their children are more interested in a fiction reading and writing. So can you tell us why they need to also practice more uh, the nonfiction reading and writing? Yeah, I mean, and I don't, I don't blame kids, right? Fiction is fun and it's important. It's a great way to learn how to read. So especially for like your elementary kids and your middle school kids, like definitely give them fiction. Um, and even in like high school and later, like fiction is important. It's a great way to be exposed to different ideas, different perspectives. You can see that in a fiction. It's important for imagining new worlds, right? If we're trying to build a better world, it's helpful to be able to see that better world. And ultimately, because that world is not real yet, it's going to be fiction. Um, and by doing that, you can hear, like, hold this mirror up to the current world. This is all great stuff for being able to be a better citizen, writing the personal statement. All of that stuff is key. Um, it's key for building empathy. It's key for understanding characters, sequence and plot. Like, I can't. There is a reason why fiction is so key in common core standards and why kids love it. But often in terms of assessment, it mostly shows up in English and history, like in terms of those grades and getting on that right track. Outside of English and some history, that sort of fiction style of writing, that sort of like grandiose with all the little like vivid language and the like powerful tones, learning how to write in that way is actually not how you're gonna be assessed. Um, in most of your classes. It's not, um, it's not what you're going to be reading. Like You're not going to be reading um, these fictional books in order to do well in science. You're not going to be reading to these fictional books to do well in most of history, um, or most of economics, most political science. You just don't read fiction. Um, and ultimately, you're not writing fiction. And you need to be being exposed in your reading to the types of writing that you're going to be doing. It's those syntax, it's those organizational structures. So you have to see it a lot. 
And honestly, like this is one of the biggest issues right now in education. The discipline of English is where our students learn how to write. But how you write for English is very different than how you would write for college unless you're in that English major. So there is this crazy learning curve for kiddos. Like this was my experience in college. I got into college, got into this, oh, right. I'm gonna kill it in college because I got in, I know how to write. Wait a minute, they're assessing me totally different. This, they don't like my you know, alliteration that I'm putting into my writing. No, they don't care um, because I never actually learned how to write for these college courses. And so having experienced myself, that, that um, I think it's like my calling to try and make sure the kids, as they get into college, know that there's a better style, that there's certain ways that college professors are looking about. And it's not about your style. Um, they're just looking for your organization. And so that's what we really focus on. Yeah, so uh, I suppose children can start their writing from uh, some fiction and uh, fiction reading, but they really need to expand their reading uh, field to more nonfiction reading, right? Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So as for the nonfiction reading writing, can you elaborate more on the importance of it? Yeah, so this is really what like um, our class at Harmony Plus focuses on. Um, it's giving students that sort of feedback, not only in content, I mean, not in content, but primarily in organization and analysis. We want those kids to have the tools moving forward on how to write thesis statements, on how to write analytical body paragraphs, of really being able to dive into the why. Those are the key skills. Um, moreover, these skills also apply to the reading ability, right? We talked about how they're connected. If you are able to do that analysis and organize your thoughts around synthesizing the main arguments and understanding the why, you will be able to read more efficiently and effectively. Um, this is like, you, cause you will actually be knowing what you should be reading for. Like you're not gonna be reading the extra stuff they put in, you're just honing in, oh, this is my main argument. This is his reason for it. Got it, good, go, move on. Like this is how you read quicker. Um, and with higher levels of understanding. And this will like help you with questions on the standardized tests, right? Like this is often what you have to do on this SAT, um, but it's also what you have to do in discussions, not only in high school, but in college, you have to be able to bring forth that analysis. Um, so it shows up on the SAT, it shows up in college, it shows up on your AP classes. They all rely on these skills but you can't write for all of these different things in the same way that you write essays for English. And too often that is that differentiation between how you write for English class and how you write for other classes is too overlooked in school. And so again, that is exactly why we focus on these skills, the ones that I just laid out and are on that PowerPoint um, in our nonfiction reading and writing program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that's why our nonfiction reading and writing program uh, is so unique and beneficial to the students. So we're going to cover, I know, a lot of different types of nonfiction reading and writing in our class. So uh, can you tell us what are the text types you have chosen and why do you choose such kind of text types? Yeah, I mean, and really our class is that is that primer, right? We focus on the narrative the informational and the persuasive. Why these three? Well, they align to common core standards. Um, so they are going to show up on any state test. This is if you are here in California or if you're in New York, same common core standards. You have to be able to interact with all three types of these um, styles of reading and writing. Um, all of our curriculum is backwards planned from these common core standards because these are the skills that you need to develop. We start with the narrative writing. Um, in particular, we focus on that memoir writing. This is because I think it's important for us as teachers to get to know the students and get to know what they are passionate about so that we can explore those passions in later topics. It's also the easiest way 
to build that level of specificity and analysis because the subject is you. You don't have to think about like outside content, some advanced stuff. It's only thinking about why you are the way you are. So that's a little bit easier. And it's also important for these um, personal statements. Um, and then we hope to spark this type of thinking in this, you know, in, in this class so that as they go on through high school, they really can bring that reflective lens to all their work. And if they can do that, they're way more set for their college uh, applications. So after that narrative, then we dive into that informational essay. In particular, we focus on the cause and effect and the problem slash solution types of essays. We really push these type of essays over the like more descriptive or chronological types of essays because these are the ones, as you can tell from the, uh, the name, they're more about analysis and they're more often what you're going to see in high school because they're like ramping up in Bloom's taxonomy towards higher levels of uh, cognitive ability. We focus, uh, we let the students choose their topics because again, the topics cover, they matter less than the actual organization and the analysis. They're going to get content in whatever high school class they have, whatever college class they have. We want them to be able to organize that content and present it clearly because ultimately that's what writings is all about. Um, however, the readings that we do use because, you know, there is that overlap, there is that intersection. We try and make them as purposely culturally relevant as possible and expose them to ideas they should be thinking about as citizens. Um, so we focus on like these core issues around identity, equality, justice, um, but we let students ultimately, they're exposed to these ideas. You don't have to write about that. You can write about whatever you're interested in because we care about that organization. Oftentimes, we will see that these are what the kids will actually write about, which is great because that's what shows up in their high school. But it's ultimately good to see that these kids are caring about these issues because that's important for them in college, but also uh, you know, as citizens. Um, finally, we end with this persuasive type. And this is, again, that op-ed you were talking about earlier. Um, and the op-ed really is our capstone. It allows them to combine all the organization and all the analysis they'd been developing in the previous into this capstone project. And our sort of our final class features this debate. Kids love debating. As you probably know from, you know, interacting with your children, they love to, you know, argue for why they should have something. Uh, this is a key skill because it shows up in their writing, it shows up in their ability to persuade in their future jobs. It's a key style that has to combine everything else that they've learned about. Um, so that's our final class, is this sort of debate around an op-ed. Great, so these uh, three types of reading and writing are actually very attractive stu to students. And uh, I want to know more about you know, the narrative part because uh, children love to read a lot of different stories and watch a lot of uh, uh, fictions and uh, non-fiction shows on the TV. So for the narrative part, I know that there are some uh, different elements. For example, the background, mm -hmm. the conflict, right? So yeah. can you tell us something more about, you know, the different elements students should include in the narrative writing? Right. And this is where, like, you know, we talked about fiction. The different fiction has all those elements, right? It has this plot arc. It has this character development. It has this author's purpose. The difference between a memoir writing and this nonfiction narrative and a fictional is one's real and one's not. Um, so it's a great way to start to tr make that transition from fiction to nonfiction. And those are the elements that we really focus on. Character development. How do you actually develop a character that people can resonate with? And so that's really thinking about what is a character. So it requires you to think about who you are because we make you the center of your narrative writing because it's a memoir. Um, but ultimately, there's this purpose. Why are you writing this? And this is what really sets like, hey, that's a great story. That's entertaining. I liked your like, um, story about your day. But 
it, to make it into that really high level stuff, the stuff that could actually get published and win these contests, it needs to have that moral, that purpose. And that's what we hone in on, the why. What did you learn from this? And so that's useful because you win contests, you grow as a person, but ultimately the personal statement. So everything is really like scaffolded to align you to get into these college, to get mm -hmm. into college. Yeah. So uh, among the three uh, different types of reading and writing, uh, which one do you think is the easiest and which one do you think is the most difficult for students? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think narrative is the easiest, um, which, I mean, they have different levels, right? Like that reflective piece can be hard for some students. They haven't often been asked to think about why do you like this? Who are you as a person? But these are things that sometimes we don't like to wrestle with. Um, so that can be hard, but typically kids are very good at the sort of uh, being able to write a plot. Kids tell stories all the time. We tell stories all the time. This is something that we get a lot of practice with. The harder thing is this sort of informational essay, which is annoying because that's often the type of essay that they get graded on all the time in high school and college. And there's like, you don't have as much freedom with the actual sentence structure, with the actual grammar, with the organization that you would in a narrative essay, right? Like narrative essay, big picture things. Informational essay, there is a very specific way that you would need to write this thesis. And if this thesis is not super clear, your entire essay is unclear and you get a bad grade. So making that transition to, oh, you can't use first and second person points of view to like, there is a very clear list and structure with your um, topic sentences and thesis sentences. Like that is a leap that kids have to be able to make, but it's good that they make that leap as early as possible. Yeah, so uh, as we know, uh, there are a number of different reading and writing courses offered in the market. So parents often ask, so uh, what makes your program so unique? So in your opinion, what are the highlights of our you know, reading and writing program? Yeah, I mean, so my background, like I, I was, uh, you know, my PhD research was at a middle school and my, uh, like I was an admin at a middle school, but uh, ultimately I was a teacher in high school. Like this is where, I have most of my experience is teaching high school. And I think that's useful because for middle school, I know what the high schooler teachers are looking for. And though, although we use our, like the reading levels are aligned to middle school, the sort of writing that I'm pushing them to be able to have is more featured at this high school content. We are gonna fully expose you to high school level quality because if you're exposed early in a form where you're not actually getting a grade that determines your future, this is how you actually get that practice and can like upgrade your skills. Um, the other thing that we use is this like multimodal um, approach to education. And if you're in education circles, multimodal is a buzzword you'll hear a lot. Um, basically all it means is you're giving multiple ways in which a student can access information and this is aligned to brain research, which kids' brains operate differently, um, especially these days. Like different kids have different ways of their brain operating. Some kids are going to learn from a video. Other kids are going to learn from reading. Other kids are going to learn from writing. Like these are the multimodal approaches. And so we can try and incorporate all of them because if you get it from every sort of dimension, every sort of mode, it's more likely that it's going to actually stick. So what this actually like, that's a lot of theory, Glenn. What does that actually mean? Um, and what this means is that for like, oh, we got to analyze plot and we got to analyze character development for the narrative writing. Let's actually look at some commercials that do this well and analyze those commercials so that we get that content. And then we can pull it out of a reading text that aligns to their common core standards. So they're getting multiple chances, multiple ways. And, you know, as kids know, as we know, it's more fun to watch videos at times than it is to like just do constant reading. Um, and I think that's important. Like we try and make our class as joyful and as fun as possible. 
because as as you know, as any kid will know, if they're not having fun, they're not learning in the same ways. Like this, this is like Finland's model. This is why Finland is so important as as such a strong school uh, system across all students is because there's a joy to learning. And when they're excited, they're not stressed. And stress we've seen actually is detrimental to learning. All right, so that's, that's multimodal. Um, there's three major writing pieces that we focus on. Um, this is the memoir, so that's aligned to their personal statement. This is like a cause and effect essay, and this is an op-ed. So we have your students be doing a lot of writing. And this is important because we give a lot of feedback there. And I think this is what I am most proud of because this is how we differentiate. Your kid comes in and like, you know, they've been getting A's in all their classes and they are, you know, writing at the level that can actually get them to be able to publish in New York Times. And most of what they're getting in our lectures is review. That's great. We're going to see that in their first draft and we are going to differentiate them and be like, oh, you're doing good. I'm going to push you to be even better. Because this is the thing about why there's so many writing pieces is you can always get better with writing. I, you know, I'm PhD and I'm still working on ways to improve my writing style. You never stop. So this is why we like have these constant uh, levels of feedback, this constant feedback cycle with them. Um, they have to write two drafts for each of these things, um, for each of these three writing pieces. And that's key to get that multiple iterations. That's how you get better, iterative process. Um, we also, you know, this is Alan, where you shine this constant feedback with the parents. It's helpful if we're all on the same page. We don't want your student to get behind in um, like, oh, if you're not getting this day one homework, you know, it builds each day. So Alan is going to make sure that your student is actually doing this so they don't fall behind and miss out on any of the educational opportunities. We keep our classroom size small because that we can actually give that high level of feedback. Like these essays take hours to feedback. And if we have too many of them, we can't give that same level of attention. So we make sure we have small classroom sizes um, that provide that individual focus. Furthermore, this is like uh, what we, this came out in this cohort a lot. We provide these individualized reading lists, you know, from the narrative writing, from their discussions in class, we figure out what the kids actually like. Um, and based off of what they're like and what I think is going to be relevant for their high school and college experience, we give them these personalized books that can like, ooh, you want, let's expose you to some of some different ideas that you might be able to pull out into your writing. So that, that's what I think our class is all about and what sets us apart yeah, from that, other classes. That's right. So we provide very timely feedback to the parents after each class regarding the students' performance and also their homework. So we really want to see the students' progress during the whole program. And as for the reading list you have provided some of the students, we find that some students are very interested in doing the reading after class. And we yeah. even have students finish reading uh about three books you know in one or two weeks so right. that's Great. so good right yeah. and uh also you mentioned about there are some uh high school content uh being taught in our current class so uh can you give us one example of the high school content will it be too difficult for you know the middle school students uh no i don't think it's too difficult because we you know we scaffold it we like to make sure we're giving you tastes of high school content. We scaffold it down and then we differentiate. If you're doing well with it, we're gonna push you even more with it. So that's that like ethos, pathos, and logos. This is something that literally you have to use on the SAT essay, is ethos, pathos, and logos. And in simpler forms, it might show up in middle school, but getting them to really assess how it shows up in persuasive writing to get them to be able to understand this log, um, like what statistics means, how it impacts people, that sort of logical if A then B. All of this stuff we expose them to um, in high school, in, in our class to get them ready for high school. And I think this is, this is ultimately like some of my favorite features of this class because when you're getting kids to like, we did this in my 10th grade class, 
analyze these commercials. And then they're starting to realize, wait a minute, this is how I'm being marketed to. This is what people are telling me. It really opens their eyes up to the world. And that's always one of our, uh, I think one of my more favorite classes. But because it is like you're analyzing commercials and trying to see what they're doing, like that is a high school skill, but it can definitely be broken down to, um, at, to middle school. That's great. So I think students are also excited to learn some more advanced content, you know, beforehand. And uh, uh, as for all of our programs, I'd like to mention that we have the nonfiction reading and writing for the four to six graders and also to the seven to eighth graders. And uh, for some students with very advanced reading and writing, we also have the citizen journalism program, which targets on the advanced nonfiction reading and writing. We also have the creative writing program, uh, which will target some of the fiction writing if students are very interested in. So uh, Glenn, you also mentioned some uh, contest about the journalism. So uh, can you elaborate more on the citizen journalism program? Because this is a very uh, attractive and tempting program for the students. Yeah, I mean, this is getting, it's going to be oriented around that sort of persuasive and informational style that they first get um, within the nonfiction reading and writing class. But then we just dive in deep into this content and really amp up the rigor of what we're looking for in these essays so that you know, when the New York Times um, contest opens up this fall, they could actually submit um, and potentially win some awards for that. So that's that like increased rigor um, of that. And so in order to get them ready for that, we need to expose them to these style, to these articles that are coming out of the New York Times or coming out about these same topics that the Times is talking about. So we, it starts off with this sort of Socratic seminar method of understanding and deeply diving into issues, exploring those issues, debating that issues. Um, and then from that, they get to, uh, um, they will be writing their op-eds and their opinions on these things. And we also will push them to do not only like feel quality, quality, the secondary research, secondary source research, which is the primary research that they will be doing. Interesting use of primary, but we also want them to be able to develop that primary skill, the primary source skills of research. So being able to conduct surveys, create surveys, create and conduct um, interviews, be able to do like real qualitative observations, because these are all skills that can show up in college um, and are things that will actually show up in your workplace that you're going to need to be able to do. How do you create a survey that doesn't have bias? That's a key skill. So we try and expose them to that in this class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So we've already received a lot of you know, questions from the parents. But before answering the questions, I'd like to mention that uh, if you, your students are more interested in you know, a lot of other programs, at Harmony Plus, apart from the reading and writing, we also offer a different uh, variety of uh, the programs to the students. For example, the test prep programs, for example, the SAT, ACT, tax prep. Uh, we have the Future Entrepreneur Challenge program that target on the students who would like to learn the business and entrepreneurship beforehand. And also we have the professor research program offered during the summer. Uh, including the capital competition training program and also the data strategy program uh, with the Berkeley professor. So uh, finally, I'd like to mention that if you are very interested in uh, enrolling in our program, you can add the WeChat and we will have our colleagues uh, contacting you. And if you have any other questions, uh, we are also very glad to give you the answers. So now let's save some time for our Q&A session. So I received some questions from the parents asking that, uh, are there any suitable programs for the students who are going to the ninth grade in the fall? So, I mean, I'll let you answer this as well, Alan, but I, the primary one that I would think for this class is going to be the, um, that citizen journalism class. Um, 
because that is going to be, yeah, I mean, that, that develops skills that were based on the middle school and it pushes it more towards a high school class, ninth grade sort of um, standard is what we're going to be trying to have them read. So that citizen journalism class would be definitely something I would push them towards. The other class that I would recommend would be that entrepreneurship class, um, getting them to think about entrepreneurship and um, like how they can actually start to think about addressing issues in their community is a key extracurricular that they can do, but also might be able to spark a larger narrative. So those are the two classes. If you're really interested in journalism or you're interested in entrepreneurship, or if you're just all, not just journalism, but just larger issues, reading, writing, that would be one. Entrepreneurship business, definitely think about that one. Yeah, so uh, if the student is very advanced in reading and writing already, we think that you know they can try the journalism reading and writing, uh, which is more advanced. And yeah. also one parent asked that uh, her son loves reading a lot, but she found that uh, even though she reads a lot of books, she he couldn't use the materials what he read in his writing. So is there a way we can help him to solve the problem? Yeah, this is kind of like, uh... This makes sense. This is that difference between fiction and um, nonfiction, right? Um, and so it's getting him to transition with these sort of like, okay, these are the ideas you have learned from fiction. How can we apply that to narrative writing? And then how can we apply that to informational? And sometimes it's just getting that, I think it's that, it's that switch to this more of like memoir writing. You want to be able to pull out these major ideas ideas um it's i'm not quite sure what materials he what writing styles he is expected to be doing but i'm imagining it is that sort of informational so like let's say he's really loving certain types of books we then expose him oh these are these common themes within those fiction books these common themes also show up in these nonfiction books, right? Okay, now by reading these articles or reading these things that you're interested in, those are the things you can actually cite and use in your writing, if it's an issue about citing. Um, if it's an issue about style and like formatting, then right, we also need to expose them to like, oh, this is how you actually write these styles. And typically we have seen once kids experience success in writing a certain way, they will be more likely to write this. We had this with our class today or this last session, one of our students just like didn't know how to write these informational essays, had never been exposed. And now she's killing it and she loves it. She like writes all of these things in these ways. She's really passionate about doing that because they have seen that success. Yeah. And also one parent asked that, uh, is there any suggestion for the current uh, ninth graders who wants to try the writing contest you mentioned? Yeah. I mean, most of these kind of come out in the, um, in the fall. They're typically aligned to the school year. So they'll start being um, announced um, come September, come October, come November is when they first open up. And then you'll be able to submit them throughout the course and then they'll close in the spring. Um, I definitely recommend that New York Times ones if they are at all interested in the um, uh, like issues in the world. Um, and that if not knowing anything about your kid, that what is it? The Scholastic one? The Scholastic, uh, let me see if I can remember the name. The second one that was mentioned, I'm going to pull it up right now again. scholastic art and writing competition that has a bunch of different ones and so you can definitely find one in there that is probably going to interest your ninth grader um the jea one has ones for both middle school and high school so i would recommend same with the new york times they both have middle school and high school so i would recommend any of those I wouldn't, you could always submit to the profiles in Courage. You're going to be going against higher level kids. So maybe I get some, you know, get some warm ups with some of these easier ones before, you know, applying to the really prestigious ones. 
So uh, a lot of parents are really concerned about, you know, the proportion between reading and writing in our class. So uh, can you tell us like how much reading we will cover, you know, during our class? Yeah, uh, we typically, we just have like one article each class um, in our reading. That is like, it's really just, here's an exposure of what this looks like so that you can see it and then apply those same things that we're pulling out Oh, how does this author do character development? What is the evidence that this author is using for his, their persuasion? Um, if you can pull that out, then you can apply it to your writing. Um, so we only really do one like article per day and do a deep dive in that. If kids, for kids who are like, I want to do more reading, we will then like, oh, okay, you're interested in, you were, here's a deeper article about the issue. Like if we're talking about climate change, I'm going to give you, here's like, here's this proposal about the Green New Deal. What do you think about that? Have some more reading response questions on that. But that is if like they are asking for more. Typically we focus more on that writing because that's the actual assessment. That's the thing where kids are missing out on is that writing skills. We use reading to build towards that, but ultimately it's about um, writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, if you have any more questions about reading and writing about your children, you can also leave your comments in the chat box. So uh, one parent asked how to stimulate, you know, children's interest in reading the nonfiction. Right. And that's like, you just got to get that shift. You got to find out what it is that they're interested in. What are they enjoying in their fiction readings? Those same themes and then find books or articles, typically it's books because that's what they're used to, that follow that same theme. Um, this is where the memoir writing is that such a nice transition because they're still reading about characters, but these characters are interacting with, like this is, it'll be set in times um, that deal with present day issues. So take like Girl in Translation which is this book about, uh, about this individual who was an Asian American who grew up in New York and was experiencing all these different uh, issues that were going on with New York, but it's through this character's lens. And so they were like, oh, this is issues of immigration. This is issues of racism. This is issues of class inequality. Oh, I'm interested in that. I see how that's connected. Let me understand that more and then they will be more interested in reading those nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, also, uh, how much of the writing will the student do in class and out of the class? Yeah, typically what we have them do, because it's an hour and a half, we have them get to some point like, all right, you're gonna write your thesis in class and then you're gonna write the rest of it out of class. Uh, this is because we want to have that check for understanding. Oh, your thesis is good. I feel confident that the rest of your essay is going to be good. But most of the writing happens outside of class so that you can write at your own pace. Um, we just have like starting points to make sure they're on that right course before we send them out to write on their own. That way they're not wasting time writing in a way that uh, doesn't actually improve their um, ability. Mm -hmm. So uh, one fifth grader as parent asked that uh, her son's teacher uh, didn't do a lot of, you know, writing assignment and uh, didn't do a lot of grading for her son's writing uh, at a school. So how to encourage uh, her son to write more at home? Yeah, and I think starting with that is just like, it's keeping a journal um, or like a diary is with the number one thing. Just write about what your thoughts are. Like this or what, um, and you can talk about like, this is what Bill Clinton did. Like he kept a diary his entire life. And you're like, you're doing it so that when you become rich and famous, you can write a really good autobiography. Um, like that's how you can sell it to your kid. Um, or just like you're getting them to write their thoughts about the day and write their thoughts about what they were reading. And I think this idea of just getting them to write down their initial thoughts about something is, is key. And you can even have it as like a sort of, you can keep it, have it private for them, or you can like, you yourself can have this sort of writing interaction with them. 
it's helpful if you model it yourself, right? This is what kids kids are going to do what their parents do. And if they're seeing their, their parents writing these things or they're seeing peers that they know do about this, like that is something that they will also take on themselves. And you can make it into a little game where like, you know, you're just writing these songs and writing these responses to it. But getting those, that transition of getting them just to write about their lives will encourage them to to um, uh, like start practicing those writing skills. There's also like, if you just look up um, like daily writing prompts, this is what we have our kids do in the beginning of the narrative is there's just like initial prompts that are kind of like silly, somewhat fun, or like what we do is we have them describe a picture and it's a goofy picture. It's like, oh, I love making stories for this. And that's a way where they can get um, that practice writing. But the key thing, like if they're writing and no one's actually reading it or giving them any feedback, it's not going to like, the kid's not going to care anymore. Like if they're doing something, but no one's caring, then like they're not going to actually do it. They're not going to keep it up. Like kids need feedback on it. They need to see that people care about what they're writing, that they're like, oh, this is funny. Uh, oh, I like what you did there. So it's got to have feedback. If you're not doing feedback, then you're like, you're really, you're not going to get the full experience from it. That's right. So feedback is extremely important. Oh, and uh, that's why during our class for each type of writing, uh, we will ask students to finish the first, the brainstorming outline, and then the first draft, the second draft, even the final draft. And after each draft, uh, our teacher, Glenn, will make very intensive feedback and the grading to the parents and uh, to let the students know. So in that way, students know how to improve after each of the writing. And that's why, you know, they can make such huge progress. Right. And uh, uh, one more parents ask that, uh, can you recommend some books for the middle school students? Um, I mean, it depends on the kid, for sure. Uh, you know, typically Har Harmony Plus has this whole list of books that, um, you know, is what they will be exposed to in high school. And that's ultimately what you want to be getting them to do, if nothing else, like expose, <laughs> this is a middle school kid, right? Like there's two, there's two ways you can do it. You can expose them so to books that they will get in high school, like the Odyssey, if they're interested in mythology, like things they carry, great books. Um, what's that other one that always like, the giver shows up a bunch. Any of these books that they might like get in some like early Steinbeck, right? If they get Of Mice and Men, that's a good one that they can get because they're gonna get Grapes of Wrath later. Um, that just exposes them so that when they get to high school, they're more ready. So like we have these list of books of all the things that they might get. That is one way. The other, if you're like, hmm, my kid is going to get these books no matter what, and I want them to be exposed to different ideas before they get to these classics, then you can focus on that. Because middle school, like, there's not that same level of requirement about reading Shakespeare or about reading, um, you know, The Great Awakening. Um, so what you can do is, oh, let's, let's just expose. Let's give them books from all over the world, from all different topics, so that they just have this wide mindset coming into high school that then they can use to like compare and contrast with those great, uh, with those classics. So those are the two routes that you can go about it. Um, exposure to other ideas or like just straight preparation. Both are successful. Thanks so much, Glenn. So due to the time limit, uh, we will, you know, stop our Q&A session here. But like Glenn mentioned, we have uh, the recommended reading list for students uh, from a different grade. So if you are interested in getting the recommended book list, please contact us and we will send you the recommended book list after the seminar. And also, if you are interested in any of the programs we have mentioned today, like the nonfiction reading and writing, the journalism reading and writing, the creative writing, and even some of the summer programs, please feel free to add our colleagues by scanning the QR code. And uh, you can also leave your comments here in the Zoom chat box. 
we are going to contact you after the seminar and uh, hope that this seminar can help you a lot in encouraging the students to do more reading and writing. And uh, thanks so much again for joining today's seminar. And we look forward to seeing you in the following uh, seminars in the future. Bye. Thanks, Glenn.